Welcome to this week's Eccentric Minute, brought to you by Eccentric. One of my favorite exercises to use with the K-Box is the K-Box Zercher Squat. Uh, the big thing with the equipment they provide is the bar is padded, so it's a lot more comfortable than you would be with a barbell, but it still is going to be all the upper back, leg, and core work of the normal Zercher Squat. A couple pro tips that I'd say here, make sure you've got a little bit more room on the strap at the top than you would guess so that you can keep it flowing smooth up and down. And I prefer to start this exercise at the bottom. So sit back, get all the way down into that deep squat position, chest up, abs tight, and start driving up. With the goal to keep your posture high and move fluidly through the range of motion, this is an absolute favorite of mine, and I hope you guys give it a try with your K-Box today. I really hope you enjoyed this week's Eccentric Minute. Make sure you check them out at eccentric.com to find out everything you need about the K-Box and the K-Pulley. Being a strength and conditioning professional requires constant pursuit of better knowledge, better methods, and better means. But what if there was a place where strength and conditioning coaches could learn from some of the most innovative practitioners in the world, such as Jeff Moyer, Lachlan Wilmot, William Wayland, James the Thinker Smith, and Kirwenham Flat? Well, you can find multiple lectures from each of these top-level coaches and a few lectures and examples from yours truly as well, all in the Strength Coach Network. The Strength Coach Network is going to bring you well over 100 different lectures from some of the top practitioners in the world to be your one-stop shop for your continuing education and professional development. So hop on over to strengthcoachnetwork.com slash today and get your 48-hour trial for only a dollar. That's strengthcoachnetwork.com slash CVASPS to get your 48-hour trial for only a dollar. I look forward to seeing you in the Strength Coach Network. Mike, thank you so much for spending the time with us today. Coach, appreciate you having me on. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Yeah, man, I'm fired up for this. We get to, we get to talk quite a bit, but uh, you know, for the three quarters of a human that doesn't know who you are, let them know, you know who Tuck is, where you are, and how you got there, man. Yeah, sure. So um, I'm the head strength conditioning coach at Villanova for the football team. Um, I've been all around the country at a lot of different schools, just kind of a journeyman, finding my way. Um, worked with a lot of different sports. So I don't think anybody needs to hear every specific school because it's been like six and eight years. But, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of mentors in my life have definitely helped molded me, one being Jeff Oliver at Holy Cross. Always want to always wanna mention him just as a human being a great individual. So he actually helped me get into the field. So definitely appreciate him, but definitely ha have been, have been all over the country trying to make it work, but I'm actually back in my hometown. So happy to be here. I didn't know you were a Philly guy. Yeah. So uh, Villanova is about 20 minutes West of Philadelphia. And then I'm 20 minutes West of Villanova, uh, Dyingtown, Pennsylvania. Okay. All right. You know, it's funny, like, that, that Holy Cross tree is one that, like, is sneakily large. I think I've had this conversation with people before, but, like, Jeff puts out a lot of – a lot of coaches. Yeah. So, um, he was my boss he – was, he was my strength coach and also my boss, like, because in the summers I'd, I'd help him coach. But – and then we'll, where he's close to Springfield, so in the summers he brings in eight or ten interns to run his camp that he, that he does. So, a lot of the Springfield – uh, people will also intern at Holy Cross, um, but yeah, a hundred percent. He's he's got a pretty good tree, and I, I like the way you said sneakily. I, I agree with that as well. Yeah, and I, I think that that's something that's one of the benefits of being in the Northeast for him is that you know you've got you're not far from Cortland, you're not far from Springfield, so you've got but you're not far from Brockport, who's put out a lot of coaches, so you've got access to be able to kind of pick and choose for some people that you would get to work with. Yeah. And, and he's a boiled disciple too. Right. So like he has some influence there and I think that attracts some people as well as right. Holy cross isn't, isn't a uh, sec school. So there's not 20 strength coaches, right? When I was a student athlete there, there was two. So there's two strength coaches for, you know, 20 some sports. So when you're in, when you're an intern there, a part-timer, like you're, you're training teams. So you get a lot of experience, which I think is an appealing draw. No doubt. And I think that, you know, people, people like to talk about, you know, you got to get in those big time positions early and this, that, and the third. But I think that there is some power. Like I started at Binghamton under Brian McGovern. I think there's some 
really important aspects to starting at more of a mid-major, small major school to get the opportunity to actually get your feet wet and, and make mistakes. Yeah, without question, lower, lower than a mid-major. I think every coach should have experience at that D3, D2, or even high school level just from an educational standpoint and teaching, right? Because if you start at, you know, the premier, you know, organization or school, you could ride the coattails of great athletes despite what you're doing. And, or you could have, you know, actionable, implementable uh, change with a, maybe a lesser athlete, but it's a, they're a direct correlation of your coaching and your program, um, which I think, like you said, too, you don't have to be necessarily as, um, what's the word I'm looking for? You don't necessarily have to be as safe right? When I think of safe, I think like, okay, I don't want to break this. I don't want to break messy, right? If we go with messy, I'm like, okay, we're going to do the bare minimum. We're going to do so little, right? But when we go into a D2, D3 guy, maybe I'm experimenting some different ideas and you can just implement a lot of different um, change in them. Yeah. And I think that when you're talking about change and you're talking about building things and being a little bit more experimental, you know, one thing that, you know, people tend to reach out to you about is the whole idea of getting kids faster. So let's, um, let's touch a little bit here on your, like kind of, first of all, your journey when it comes to starting to put together ideas and, and build kind of the, the speed idea with what you do with the young people you get to work with. Yeah. So, so at Villanova, we will implement a high low model, but essentially like you hear a lot of guys talking about we'll reverse engineer the sport. Right. So when you break down the sport of college football, right, 72, 72 plays, 12 drives, six plays a drive, four to six seconds of play, 25 seconds between plays. So when we look at our field work, when it translates to that, I'm going to try and prepare them for that sport action. So for an O lineman, it's getting in the way for three and a half seconds or driving somebody off the ball five yards. When it's a DB, it's backpedaling seven, turning, flipping a hips, open up and run for 20. And I got to get them to do that repeatedly, right? But we were talking about this right before the show, okay? The best guys who can repeatedly do it are the fastest guys. So if your guy runs a 4-3 versus a guy who runs a 4-6, but all that 4-6 guys does is condition, the 4-3 guy, no matter how many times he doesn't condition, is still going to be able to repeat that because 4-6 is a jog in the park for him. So when we look at re uh, reverse engineering the sport, that's our, that's our baby, and then we branch off of that. So the way we branch off of that is the high-low Charlie Francis uh, CNS model, and then we break up a cell max V it, within those high CNS bouts. So those are from a teaching philosophy. Those are kind of the themes of the day, so they can ingrain those movement patterns. And then physiologically, we're sending the same response. And then on the low days, we're building the aerobic base. So that's going to help the increase uh, the repeatability of said sprint. So... That's kind of the, the very general umbrella outline of it, I guess. Yeah, you know, I think that one thing that, you know, all of a sudden, and, and then Sivas might be kind of at fault with it because Ben didn't, uh, Dr. Ben Peterson did a great presentation about that whole repeated uh, repeatability in bouts with ice hockey players. And I think that as we normally do, we got on the pendulum swing and went so far to repeatability that people forgot. Like if you can repeat things over and over again and you suck, you still suck. Like I am Joseph Johnson, I think said it best. Like, I don't care how many times you could do something. If you're bad at it, you're still bad at it. Like it doesn't matter. So get them fast first and build it from there. With, without question, we need to increase the output, right? And, Charlie, and speaking of that, Charlie Francis, right? It doesn't matter how many times you can jump if you can't touch the rim. You're still getting zero rebounds. Like, that's the net result, right? And you're a basketball guy. I'm a football guy. So we don't have a corner who doesn't matter how good in shape he is. If he runs a 4-9, he's not getting on the field. And if he does, we're in big, big trouble, right? So when we understand that, we want to increase the outputs and, and then – when we look at, okay, what do we want to increase? We want to increase speed. The first thing I'm going to do is not go in the rack and, and attach some bands to the bar and speed squat, right? That's what, two, two meters a second, 2.5 meters a second when sprinting's 8, 10, 12 for elite. 
uh, elite athletes. So why would, why would we go to a rack, which is the least specific thing you can do, where the field is right next to the weight room and we can go out there and sprint. So that's like the, the ideology behind it, I suppose. So then this is one that I've, I just selfishly need to ask because as we start into, this will be the second week of September when this comes out. Um, but when, when it comes to that aspect of it, the understanding that what we do in the weight room doesn't necessarily translate to speed. But like Buddy says, typically if you sprint, you're going to lift better. Mm. How do you sell that to the guys? Because more often than not, football players love the weight room. Mm. So how do you get that point across? How do you get these guys to buy into, hey, man, we got to run faster. We got to get outside. We don't necessarily need to just uh, rip it and rip it on the hand cleanser. Yeah, it's a really good question because without you could be on the best program and the worst program in the world, if there's no buy-in, it's pretty relevant. Um, so with our guys, it all starts with relationships and creating that buy-in through there. And then everybody wants to get faster. Like there are dudes who dislike the weight room, whether, and like, it's like pulling teeth, everybody has them. But if I say, Hey, I can take you from a, a four, six to a four, five, and it's going to increase your game X, Y, Z everybody will be fired up. The ones who aren't would probably be the bigs. And then you can point them to, right, the 300 pounders. It's like, okay, you're going to reach people quicker. You're going to get up to the second level quicker, right? And by the way, look at the stats of last year's first round draft picks and tell me how fast all those OLs are. So when we kind of correlate it that way, um, there's increased buy-in. And from a, from a bigs perspective, I'll stay on them. It's like, Hey, do you want to go run gassers? You want to run like a, a 20 and then just like rest for two and a half minutes. Like, which would you rather do? Um, but we have, we have like a great group of guys. So, so I don't have a ton of issues there. Um, but that, that's kind of my answer to that. No, I, I dig it because I think that, that you know, and then the, the big guys, you know, they, what do they like to say? They're overworked and underappreciated more often than not. And I think that when you're looking at what they do, I don't think people understand how much output they actually have to put out to run a 10 or a 20 and how much carryover that's actually going to have and that get out and when they run into somebody that's right across the ball from. Yeah. When well, we're looking at like the collision factor that you just said, I mean, 300 pounders when they're, they're colliding against another 300 pounder, there's a ton of isometric tor uh, tension there right? And they're at their joint angles, like that is a challenging thing to do. And then they'll just coin them as lazy when they see them coming in last in the 300 yard shuttle or the gasser. It's like that dude's hauling around a ton of weight, right? His foot contact does not equal your DB's foot contact. Like that is a different foot contact. So we need to take that into account with their overall distances, volume and yardage that we're accumulating with them. Um, and I think another misconception when it comes to that is pairing the weight room with the field work, right? If you're doing eccentric Nordics right before you go out and sprint, you're going to have a bad time, right? If you're doing it the day before, you could still be having a bad time. So understanding how you manipulate the pairing, right? Because the athlete's one organism and stress is holistic, as you know, right? The, the manipulation of the field work while utilizing the weight room is, is extremely valuable because it's not like you ignore one or the other. You have to coincide they shouldn't be competing they should be complementary 100 percent. and i think that that's something that especially we as a profession i think are starting to get better at but i can tell you as, as an old head like that's something that we used to be terrible at it would be like well you put your strength program together and it's like all lined up and progressions and this that and the third and then it's like then you put together your your speed program and it's all these things and, and it was never like it was like a, a six course meal right it was like your strength stuff your conditioning stuff your agility stuff your your speed or conditioning whatever's left and it's just like none of it would match like when you would go back and you look at like the older things that we used to do we, what that I used to do, at least, I'm not going to throw everybody in this bucket. I'm sure there's a hell of a lot of people that are way smarter than me at all this. 
but like now being able to take a step back and, and understand that, and it took a while. Um, I think that that's exceptionally valuable. And I think that's something that, that needs to be talked about is how you look at that, like how you break that down mm-hmm. and how you kind of weigh where the time is being spent, right? Because I mean, right now you're, you're limited with where that time can be spent anyway. Yeah. That, and I'll put myself in that bucket too. With every program I write, it's, it's covered in red ink. Uh, when I look back a year, um, two, two years, especially a year, three years, I'm like, okay, that, that guy's terrible. Um, but I'm always trying to challenge myself and get better. But when you, when you look at marrying up the stimuli, right? The Tony Holler had a quote, don't let tomorrow be ruined by today. Um, what are we preparing these guys for? That's what we'll go back to. So when you look at a big, okay, you know, max strength is important. Yes. But if it was the most important thing versus rate of force development or power, right then we would have unlimited amount of time to push somebody off a ball, which in reality, we don't, we have, you know, less than a second, maybe two. (laughs) If if it takes you three seconds to move a guy, the running back's getting tackled for a loss. So those bigs, they won't live at the max strength. We want them to be exceptionally well at the strength, speed, speed, strength stuff. When we look at a DB, how often is he even up there, right? It's not even close in my opinion. So you have to reverse engineer a sport like we mentioned, and I sound like a broken record, and then marry up the stimuli accordingly. So then when we look at it, like when we zoom in on the week, all right, I need to make sure the field work is, is placed in an emphasis. So let's say Monday. Monday, maybe a low CNS day for us if, you know, they're coming off a, a two-day bender or uh, our guys maybe not taking care of business on the weekend so I can prep them up for that Tuesday high day. So it's going to be that Monday is going to be low in the way your man on the field. So on the field, extensive hops, rudimentary hops, uh, maybe some extensive med ball work, um, multi-directional tempos, depending on the time of year. And then in the, in the weight room, right. We're not going to do any hang clean power, clean stuff because I want them to be ready to go for that field session on Tuesday. Right. So we could do some upper body auxiliary stuff and, depending on what time of year if, and, and who you follow with the motor unit recruitment chart, Charlie Francis, um, you know, you can do a heavy bench, things like that, but we're going to stay steer clear of the high CNS high output stuff on that Monday, because come Tuesday, they need to either accelerate really, really well or, or hit max V really, really well. Right. So then that Tuesday comes around in the weight room and we're looking at more of our, our concentric based lifting, right? Maybe a trap bar deadlift, Okay, or, or, or your speed end of the spectrum of your lower body explosive lifts or total body explosive lifts, because I still need to have them sprint again really, really well Thursday or Friday. So if you're going to look at that heavy strength stuff, the really strenuous eccentric strain or your max effort in the weight room or high volume, that's always going to be in the back end of our week. And, and I think like Cal Dietz outlined it like that when he flipped his conjugate in, in triphasic. But for us, the reasoning, you know, that, that, that definitely has an, some influence, but the reasoning is because I need them fresh for that field session on, on Thursday or Friday. So I'm going to do all that st- extremely strenuous stuff towards the back end of that week because I value the field so much. Yeah, that's kind of 180 degrees for how the traditional strength coach would look at it. You think so? Um, oh, 100%. I think, I think the coach and, and like, who knows if I'm right, quote unquote, right, right. Every, every model is flawed. And when I look at that, I just want to allocate the amount of time, energy, effort, resources into sport and what's important in sport, right? We just p- talked about the DB who runs a four nine, like, great. I got a squat of 30 pounds. Guess what? He still can't get off the hash. So it's pretty irrelevant. So we need to drive his max velocity up, or we're going to have a serious issue with him on the football field. Okay. And, and like, don't, don't get me wrong. Like our bigs are pushing extremely heavy sleds for their strength work. They're doing um, a ton of heavy lifting in the weight room, but at what cost and what, what adaptation are you truly trying to drive up? Right. We have dudes who squat over 550, 600, and I won't let them touch over 90%. Like it's irrelevant. You're strong enough to play college football. You, you did that job. You filled that bucket done. It, it's there. Now, where else can we drive up adaptations? No, oh, yeah, totally. Like we were talking about a little before we started, it's just looking at whether it's the force velocity curve or your repeatability versus output 
curve or however you want to look at it. Like if you've got one spot that's way up and way out in a different area, it's no longer a curve, right? It turns into an S. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I forget who said it, but they were talking about bench presses. Like the guy who benches 245, you know, and just tries to do that repeatedly over time, isn't going to be great at a 225 rep test. And everybody kind of gets that. And it's like, okay, if I have a 400 pound bench, I'm going to be better at 225 bench press. And it's like, okay, it's the exact same idea, speed. <laughs> so, so, I mean, and, and I think coaches are really getting better at it, but you still see a lot of mat drills, gassers, 300s around, you know, intensive 110s around the country at every level, right? It, it, it's at every level. And that's just not, not something that I believe in. Yeah, so now when we're talking about driving those decisions and, and making those calls when it comes to how you're interworking things, I mean, you obviously need to have some form of measurable that you're looking at to kind of tick boxes. Mm -hmm. uh, where, what are those, and how did you come, come to the conclusion that these are the things that you're going to look at? Yeah, we'll look at fly tens and, and jump mats a lot. Um, you know, and as you know, if you have a group of 30 football guys, the idea, I, if you have one, we have a, one Cybex timing system, ideally, like, you're going to be out there two hours. You know, if you have two groups of 35, maybe with the times we're in right now and our groups are smaller, maybe we'll break them out more frequently. Um, but the jump mats do really well for us because we have four of them and guys can go on and off very quickly. Um, and kind of how we, we think of that is just, again, what is the goal of the game? The goal of the game is not to there. And, and I said this quote and people like it or don't like it. Like, There's no squat rack at the 50. Like, that's great. You can bench press 400 pounds. Like if, if my guy runs around you, it's irrelevant. Um, you know, we still got dudes benching and squatting. and everybody gets up in arms about that stuff, but what, what's the game demands and then how do we prepare them for the game demands as closely as possible? Um, so a lot of general stuff early off season, just like everybody, but then we want to get, more creative, more specific, and more like zero in on that bullseye as the sport gets closer and closer. And right now we have 11 months. So guess what we're doing right now? Extremely basic rudimentary stuff. And then what do you feel that that extra time is gonna actually provide for you and the guys? That's a really good question. So we just wrapped up our first week at Villanova training wise. And it's a lot of qualitative stuff, asking the guys how they are. You know which guys didn't train, right? You have a traditional bell curve when they're home for five weeks. And guess what? A lot more guys are going to be on the lesser training side with gyms being closed and all the precautions. I know in Philly, in Philadelphia area, they were kicking kids out of parks. Like you couldn't even go to a park and train. Like cops were sitting in front of the tracks. It was, it was ridiculous. But as like, as I see them week one, there's no need to, to dive into it because what they've done the last five months, we have no idea. So we have a really, really good opportunity to slow cook them and teach and be extremely good educators here. And maybe necessarily without as much sport coach interruption or influence, which I think is a big part, right? You can have four or five weeks of solid training and the sport coach wants to steal time or the sport coach wants to do mat drills or the sport coach wants to, you know, get into practice sooner rather than later. And it's like, okay, we can really slow cook this process and help educate our guys. So I think we have a really, really good opportunity here in order to do some really positive change in preparing our guys for next year where like maybe the injury rates are going to be lower, hopefully, right? You, you like to think if you have this much time and you're, and you're slow cooking them as you are, I'd, I'd like to think that, but um, I think that's some of the positive incremental change that we can all create as coaches. So then when you get into those conversations, that's a tough sell too, though, right? To get the coaches, and we've talked about this a little bit too, like to get these coaches to kind of understand that like, maybe right now, special work isn't what's most important. Like we don't need to be out there running over and around pads and, and doing all this extra stuff that we should we should actually be doing, I mean, not, I mean, as we talk on a Saturday, they shouldn't be doing it right now. They should probably be running into somebody on the other team, but it's like, you know, doing things of that nature. Maybe, maybe now is not the, the best times. So how is that something? I think that a lot of coaches are having a hard time with that. How is that something that you've been able to work with your staff to kind of mold this whole year plan? 
Yeah, that that's another good question because it, it's a hard one, right? Because there's no right answer. It's based on the relationships you had previously. If you didn't have quality relationships and good rapport with the coaching staff previously, you're probably you're probably having some really hard conversations right now. And you're probably on the on the butt end of those conversations. So when we look at that, it's like, okay, have you built that trust? Have you built that rapport? Have you explained it concisely to them the pros cons of each? I think that's really important. And then understanding like everybody's anxious right now, right? Every single athlete wants to train more, wants to do more. They're happy to be back. Every single coach wants to start coaching their guys and get after it and do more, do this, do that. And it's like, we just went from zero to a hundred, right? We went from zero for five months, right? Zoom meetings aren't the same as, you know, your socially distanced in person's meetings, right? Me giving you a body weight card and telling you to sprint is not the same as us doing it on the field or in the weight room. So, when we gear up and go zero to hundred, I think having those analogies in your back pocket help a lot because, you know, you could say acute to chronic workload ratio all you want, but that might not resonate with a lot of coaches. Um, so I think when you analyze what the athletes have done and what they, and how long of a time frame we have to do, we have, you know, we could go to the four coactive model and really periodize this thing out and, and make sure that we're really ready come next August right? Because that's, that's our aiming point next August. You know, some people will say the spring, maybe it's the spring, who knows? I'm, I'm not a doctor. Yeah, me neither. And I think that the one thing that I've been lucky with, with our sportsman guy is that like, we both kind of had the entire thought process of the latest will be January and it's easy to turn the temperature up to pick it up. So like, like with hoops, it's just been like, yo, we're good. Like, and what's different for us, it's super unique. I mean, sometimes football teams have this, but like, we, we brought back one guy that's under the age of 20. So it's like, geez. Yeah, it's like, all right, fellas, like, we're, we're good. Like, let's just yeah. let's make sure we're in shape. Let's start to get back in with the ball. Let's, you know, you know, knock wood, no itises minimum, you know, soft tissue, anything like, let's just, you know, it's, you guys are as old as I look, like we don't need to be in such a hurry to like ramp this up. Cause we don't know if we're playing in November or January or 2022 or what. So yeah, breathe. Yeah, exactly. And then, and, and lay the foundation, right. They're going to go play pickup on their own. Our guys are going to go do, you know, seven on, hopefully not seven on seven, but go do one-on-ones on their own or just, tr- just route trees and break trees on their own. They're going to do that stuff. We don't need to do that right now. We need to ingrain proper movement patterns, right? Be extraordinarily basic and go very slow and they'll fill in the other stuff. They're not going to go do rudimentary hops on their own. Maybe they will, um, but they're going to go do the football or basketball specific stuff on their own. So the coaching staff perspective just slow cook, slow cook, slow cook, because there's time. Like you said, you can always turn up the heat, right? Cure, cures, don't burn the cake analogy, right? We have time. We can always put the cake back in the oven. Yeah, and I think that, you know, the other thing too is it's like at the end of the day, like they were talking yesterday, now the Big Ten might start Thanksgiving, right? Like if you need more than eight weeks to get them prepped, like I don't think anybody's going to drop a, a date like if the NCAA says we're going to start mid-November, November 10th still, uh, if they drop that the second week of September, it's like we still got like six weeks, we're going to be fine. Like we, we've done enough to have enough of a base to be ready. Like we're good. Like we don't yeah. need to – we don't need to be doing max effort anything right now because we don't know when the end is, is set. Exactly. There's no point to work backwards from currently, right? There's no point to work backwards from. So where do we start? And it's like, everybody's kind of sitting there like this with their hands up. Uh, I don't know. So everybody's trying to manipulate their own unique package. And I just hope that we are on the safer, lesser side of that as the holistic stress of returning to campus, having a mask glued to your face 24 seven, right? Having teachers who are maybe incompetent with Zooms as, as I am, 
um, in, in trying to establish, right, a classroom culture. Like, there's so many different psychological factors during this time. It's insane. Right? We don't know what these kids are going through on a daily basis. I don't know how I'd, how I'd manage doing this at 19, personally. So us as global load managers, right, as James would like to say, like, we need to take that holistic 20,000 foot view approach. Yeah, I think that that's another huge point too. And I think that that's one that we probably need to all be a little better at when it comes to communicating right now is that like, take everything else out. If everything else was the same, just the fact that you have to wear a mask all the time is such a huge alteration to daily life and a huge just body stressor like that our training needs to accommodate to that. Yeah, I mean, the mat, like when you dive into like some of the really, the really intense breathing stuff, like the Brian McKenzie, the Patrick McCown stuff, it, it's like tremendously uh, beneficial if, you know, you're doing the nasal breathing, the nitric oxide, right? The natural humidifier, like all that stuff. And now it's like, oh yeah, by the way, you're gonna have a cloth over your face now for 16 hours a day. And, and I'd be lying if, if I knew the very specifics of that, you know, maybe you could enlighten us, Jay, but um, I, I know that that's definitely gonna come into play with the parasympathetic sympathetic nervous system and, and overall their, their breathing rates for sure. Dude, I, I could say this. I, I can't tell you what's going on with it with the kids yet, because I don't think we've been far enough down the rabbit hole. But as a 41-year-old has-been who only trains in the weight room and is on a, an ERG every day, I can tell you this, that it's like putting that mask on for in a racquetball court that's 90% humidity and trying today to, to row five 750s at ascending pace. It's like you might as well just be underwater. And I can't imagine what like these next like few weeks, like how my recovery curves are going to look. Um, and like this, that's what I do. So I can't imagine like a kid who's a basketball player or a football player who's coming into a weight room and is now training in one of these. And it's not like what they, like I enjoy doing that. Like they enjoy doing what we ask them to do more often than not. And now they put these devices in front of their face that are challenging. Like I, I can't imagine what that shift is going to be like. And it, it actually has been why we've moved as slow as we have. Yeah, no, you definitely have to take that into account if you're saying, okay, well, we'll just bump the maxes down 10%. Right, and everybody will be good to go. It's like, all right, well, you have no idea who had access to weights. You have no idea who did the card or had access to a field or anything like that. Like, you got to assume aerobically these guys are trash, and you got to assume max strength wise these guys are trash. Hopefully, they were doing some sprinting. And, you know, what you put value in prior to the pandemic is what they were doing during the, during the quarantine, right? If you put a ton of value into bilateral back squatting, I got news for you, they weren't outside sprinting and they weren't running tempos. Right, if that's truly what you value, and then you crush them doing mat drills two weeks out of the year, um, so I think what you put a ton of emphasis on is what's going to be owned and worked on when you're not around. So having that mask over your face now, as I revert it back to what we were initially talking about, uh, as I leave that tangent where it was, <laughs> the mask is going to drastically change how you return to sport, practice, lifting, running. I know for me, if I'm, if I'm outside running tempos and I breathe heavy, um, the mask goes into my mouth half the time. And I'm like, sh like, damn, like, and then you gotta like yank it off in order to like get your breath back. And, and it's, just an, it's, just another, it's just another thing that everybody has to deal with. So when the, coach, when the kids complain about it, the coach complain about it, it's like, we're not unique. This is the exact same thing every other school, every other athlete in the country is dealing with. So we just got to find a way to get it done. And we have to be maybe smarter in how we work around it. Yeah, and I think that that's the biggest thing is just trying to find better, more efficient ways to be smarter as we work around it, dude. 
I don't know what else there's to say about it. Well, listen, Tuck, let me get you out of here with this, bro. Where can, uh, first of all, where can people run with you? Where can they find out more about that? And, and how can they how can they get in line with old Greatbeard here and try to find a way to get faster? Yeah, yeah. It's going to be a party in, in September, man. So we're a launch Sprint Timber this year. Uh, just, a, just a fun, interactive month, doing a, dropping a ton of educational stuff on uh, my Instagram, as well as just trying to, like, promote speed development and training for speed rather than training in what I like to, and I might trademark here, lactic bath um, area. But my Instagram is tuckermike43. And if you want to sign up, it's at just-sprint.com slash sprinttember. Um, so again, man, come join the party. We'll be, we'll be sprinting all month and posting fly times and doing all that fun stuff. So it's similar to uh, some other unique month slogans around the industry. So, you know, we're going to, we're going to have a good time. Dude, totally going to have a good time. And it'll probably be the most fun for everyone just to see how absolutely abysmal my times are. <laughs> I, I am wildly slow. I will say that. I am, I am not a fast individual. I'm washed up linebacker. So myself. So nah, Jay, I really appreciate you having me on, man. It was fun. Good conversation. Yeah, brother. Appreciate your time, man. We'll make sure we get all that in the, uh, in the notes and we'll be in touch real soon, homie. All right, buddy. Take care. Yeah, man. Cheers.